book of Revelation, the Apostle John describes Jesus as the Lamb on the throne. He paints a triumphant picture of Christ. Today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg explains how the description and imagery John used encouraged early believers who were facing significant trials and persecution because of their Christian faith. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. In turning to the final book of the Bible, we turn to a book that is, for some people, avoided at all costs, and for other people, a focus of almost their entire preoccupation. And uh, by the time this study ends, you will probably have me pegged uh, somewhere in between those two things, and if you do, then you will be right. Let me just say to you, though, that it is my firm conviction after reading the book of Revelation and studying my Bible over many years, that uh, we ought not to regard uh, the book of Revelation as if it were a book of riddles, as if it were some kind of theological Rubik's Cube, that uh, certain people who have fertile imaginations are able to unpack for us and make all the colors turn to the right shade on every side. And the way to ensure that we do not go wrong is to do what we've tried to do on each occasion and to remind ourselves that the Bible was written, first of all, not to us, but that the Bible was written in this instance to first-century believers who were being buffeted by and persecuted by the authorities of their day. What possible benefit would it be to those people in those circumstances to have a book written to them that was only of significance in 2009. Not a lot. Therefore, it is imperative that we understand that John is writing to an historic context to a group of people who lived in real places at a real time, and he does so in order to assure them. Goldsworthy, who is one of my favorite Australian theologians, says, John's first concern is not to minister to armchair prophets 
in some far-off age, but to the battlers of his own day who struggle to reconcile the fact of their suffering with the fact of Christ's victory over sin and Satan and death. And he introduces himself in chapter 1 as both their brother and companion in sufferings. And he tells them, this is where I was. I was on the little island of Patmos, off the coast of modern-day Turkey. And why was John on this particular island? Well, he tells us still there in verse 9 that I was on this island because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It would seem that he had been banished there on account of his commitment to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he doesn't write to them as an armchair theologian. He doesn't write to them speculative material that may be of only passing interest to them, but he writes in order that in the circumstances of their day, they might understand who Jesus is as triumphant Lord and King. Think about it. The gospel had been preached, and they had believed. That's why they were the recipients of this letter. The gospel that had been preached to them was the historic data concerning the person and work of Jesus. The apostles had not gone around primarily to give their testimonies, although they were quite free in sharing their own encounters with Jesus, but they had gone to make sure that their congregations and their listeners understood that Jesus Christ, as Messiah, had to suffer. They were preaching Jesus, who was crucified, dead, buried, raised, had appeared, and had ascended. And these first-century believers had been on the receiving end of this and had come to entrust themselves to it. So, what did they believe? They believed that as the ascended Lord and King, this Jesus was fully in control of all circumstances. They were absolutely convinced that even as he had gone, so he would return. And as they got up to a new day, they looked, as it were, into the future, wondering when he would appear. His will was being established throughout the whole earth. That was their conviction. But when they actually looked at their circumstances, their circumstances were so vastly different from their convictions. The things that they told one another, the things that they affirmed for one another, the things that they told their friends and their neighbors, none of it appeared to be happening. And scoffers abounded. Remember in Second Peter, the scoffers will come, Peter says, and they appear and they, and they show up and they say the same thing all the time. Where is the promise of his coming? Everything continues the way it has been going for ages. I mean, we've been looking around, and we don't see any evidence at all. And the thing that made it so galling was that, in one sense, they were absolutely right, because there was no obvious evidence of the fact that he was about to return. And the church, i.e., the believers who are the recipients of this letter, they were small. There was an addition here and there but there was nothing of significance happening. And while they were small and beleaguered and persecuted, the empires of man were growing in strength and in significance. And as the Roman Empire grew in strength and significance, so the sense of aggravation and persecution that was thrust upon the people of God increased in its intensity. And when they gathered for their little services, it seemed so paltry in contrast to the idol worship that filled their cities. It's not hard to imagine that at the breakfast table, men and women of average faith would have had occasion to look at one another and wonder, to say to each other, is this faith of ours just a private matter after all? Is this faith of ours just sufficient for worshiping 
in the church, hidden away from all the pubs and all the politics and all the mighty influence of the nations of the world? Is our Christian faith up to the demands and challenges that confront us in this Roman Empire with this emperor worship? And while they affirmed in their testimony the lordship of Jesus and suffered in their lives for that same testimony, doubtless the evil one would come and insinuate that they had actually bought into a great delusion that they were just, after all, a funny little group of people, that had hitched their wagon to a strange story about a strange man at a strange moment in time, and if they just held their breath, it would all be finished before too long, and they could get back to whatever it was they were doing before. I always laugh when people tell me, oh, I'd love to go back to the church in the first century. That must have been terrific back there, you know. Would you? Would you like to have gone back to that? Why? So that you could be persecuted? So you could be thrown to the lions. So you could gather with a small group of people and stand on your tiptoes and look out over the future and wonder about these very things. Now, with all of that by way of background, this is the context in which the great drama, this great theological comic book, this great video, this great video game that is here in, in the book of Revelation is given to these people. And it's very important that we understand this. Because in the majority of cases, most of us have been brought up with a view of Revelation that is entirely distinct from that. It's all about something. It's all about us to begin with, and it's all about then. Well, in actual fact, until we know that it is not about us, but it's about Jesus and it's about the people to whom it was written, we will immediately go completely wrong. Leon Morris, who is an excellent fellow, Anglican, you will remember, says, to also an Australian, to a church perplexed, by such problems, Revelation was written. It was sent to a little, persecuted, frustrated church, one which did not know what to make of the situation in which it found itself. And John is taken up, and on the Lord's day, he speaks and prophesies and finally writes. So let me say it for the last time to make the point. We dare not regard the book of Revelation as an intellectual puzzle set to a relaxed church with time on its hands and an inclination for solving mysteries. As if somehow or another, the book of Revelation is for sort of people who like theological crossword puzzles. Well, you say, if this is the case, what possible relevance is there in such a book? If these people are a small, beleaguered church, if they are persecuted from without, if there is idol worship, if there is emperor worship and everything else, what possible relevance could it have for us then in reading it? Aren't we supposed to read about it and just think about time immemorial? No. Are, are, we, both, are, we, living in the same, are we living in the same world? Could you honestly ask what possible relevance a book written to a small, increasingly insignificant church is in a world that is increasingly oppressive to that church, that is increasingly interested in the worship of everyone and everything except Jesus Christ as Lord of all? No, I suggest to you that the message of the book of Revelation, the main thing and the plain thing of the book of Revelation, is exactly what is needed by the church in our day. Because here we are, and what are we facing? Economic gloom, human deprivation, a world at war on multiple fronts, issues of morality and security and personal identity, unravel the minds of men and women and threaten to undo them. And in the midst of all of that, there are companies of God's people because he has purposed to put us there. And in all of that threatening environment and increasingly in our generation, increasingly secular environment, we then turn to our Bibles. And I don't know how you feel, but it is not uncommon for me to feel as if I were almost a cog in a vast machinery, that the decisions that are made in London or are made in Kabul or are made in Washington or are made in Delhi, India, 
somehow or another really holds sway, and that there's nothing whatsoever that I can possibly do about it. I'm simply caught up in the immensity of it all. And the people who apparently know a lot aren't smart enough to know how much they do not know. Now, it is in that environment that you and I live. And it is in that environment, to some extent, that those who were the recipients of this letter live. And so perhaps we, like them, would find ourselves saying, in circumstances such as this, if only somehow or another somebody could go behind the scenes, if only somebody could go back there into the book of destiny, if only somebody could catch a glimpse into the future and find out really what's going on, and then they don't have to tell us everything, but if only they could tell us something, then uh, that would be really terrific. And that is exactly what we have. John is exactly in that place. I turned round, verse 10, on the Lord's day of chapter 1. I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it out to the seven churches. And what we discover when you read these early chapters is that John is picked up and transported, and not to a never-never land— but if you like, to the ever, ever land of God's eternal values and judgment. And in chapter 4 and verse 2, here we find him before a throne that is higher than all the thrones that this world has known. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And then in chapter 5, as we have seen, and in verse 4, now we find him confronted by this circumstance, which brings him absolutely to tears, because he discovers that there is no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth who can open the scroll or look inside it. And there he is depicted as weeping and weeping, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. But wait a minute. Just when it seems as if all is lost, he gets a tap on the shoulders. And one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. Look. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. 49, 10 of Genesis. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet— until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. See, what John needed was not new information, and neither do you. If you constantly think that what you need to keep you stable in your Christian life or to advance you in your Christian life is new information, I want to tell you that the vast majority of occasions when you feel that way, you're, not, you're, you're looking in the wrong direction. What John needed is what we need, to be reminded of what we know, because we usually go wrong by forgetting the basics. That's why our mothers always said to us, did you remember to? Did you remember to? When you were over at your auntie's house and you came back, she said, did you remember to say thank you? You didn't need a fresh revelation or something. You didn't need a star up above her garden. You just need to remember. And the tap on the shoulder comes. Don't weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Well, this is just terrific, isn't it? God has provided in Jesus the solution to the tears that John is crying— and God has provided in Jesus the tears which we cry. And it's nice when God comes and gives us a tap on the shoulder and turns us to our Bibles and says, are you forgetting something, that the lion of the tribe of Judah has actually triumphed, that he is king? And so John looks. He's told to look. Don't weep. See. And then look at verse uh, 6, is it? Uh, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing to the center of the throne and encircled by the four living creatures. See the lion, 
he looks and sees a lamb. And we, like him, see the Lion of Judah only as he comes to us as a slain lamb. And that's why in the second half of verse 9, when they're singing their new song, it is only in Christ crucified that they were going to discover the answer to their alienation and to their dislocation. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God. Because, you see, the secrets of their world in the first century and the secrets of the world in our century belong to God, and none of us can pry into them. None of us knows what a day brings. None of us knows what will happen tonight during the night. Who knows what this next few months holds for us in Western culture, especially if we feel it to be a dark and an unknown future? But we don't need Jesus, as it were, to come in order that we might be identifying the fact that our world is full of troubles. We can do that ourselves. We can look around and understand that, even as the recipients of this letter could. They didn't need anybody to appear out of the darkness and say, you know, you're in a very dreadful situation with all of this persecution and everything that's going on. They understood that. They didn't need Jesus to come and give them the information. They needed Jesus to come and give them the explanation so that their troubles would not bring them down, perplex them, and overwhelm them. Remembering that Jesus is triumphant when we're tempted to despair. An encouraging reminder from today's message titled, Lamb on the Throne. You're listening to Truth For Life Weekend with Alistair Begg. Alistair mentioned we often go wrong by forgetting the basics. That's why it's important to review and celebrate the story of Jesus' birth and to anticipate his return every Advent season. There are times, however, when the Christmas story can become so familiar, we fail to grasp its magnitude. The miraculous can easily become mundane. And that's one reason why books like the new devotional Repeat the Sounding Joy can be so refreshing. The author of this book, Christopher Ashe, takes us into the Christmas story in a novel way. He helps us view it through the eyes of those who were present as Jesus was born. Repeat the Sounding Joy is the perfect resource for the Advent season. It's rich with Scripture. It includes songs and prayers. There's plenty of space for recording personal reflections. Find out how you can request your copy of the book today by tapping on the image you find on the mobile app or by visiting truthforlife.org. Again, that's truthforlife.org. If you are a frequent listener to Truth For Life, you know we take great care in selecting resources like Repeat the Sounding Joy. These resources complement our mission to teach the Bible in a way that is clear and relevant for daily life. And that's the same reason why we teach from the Scriptures every day of the year, so that God's Word will be heard by as many people as possible all around the world. It's our hope and our prayer that all who hear this program will come to trust Jesus for their salvation. Maybe you'd like to learn more about the gospel message. If that's the case, we want to invite you to visit truthforlife.org slash the story, where you'll find a short video presentation. I'm Bob Lapine. Hope you can join us again next weekend for the conclusion of our series, To Know Christ. Alistair will share with us a helpful tip on how we can understand the plot in the book of Revelation. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.